join with Dr. Gregory Doolin to discuss Thomas Aquinas and his appropriation of the mystical and theological texts of the church father, Pseudo-Dionysus the Areopagite. During the 13th century, a number of theological texts were being circulated among university academics. One in particular was a patristic author and styled Neoplatonist who stylized himself as being an early Christian convert contemporaneous with St. Paul. Dr. Gregory Doolin received his, P his BA in political theory from Georgetown University in 1993 and his PhD in philosophy from the Catholic University of America in 2003. He taught philosophy at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. from 2004 to 2005 and joined the faculty of the School of Philosophy at the Catholic University of America in 2005. Dr. Doolin's research interests are in the area of Aquinas' metaphysics, and in recent years, his focus has been on Aquinas' account of the Aristotelian categories of being. Gregory, thank you so much for joining with us today. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having me, Hunter. So, yeah, I figured we, we might just dive right into the subject matter, but maybe before we could, we, we begin, uh, we maybe, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, you know, what, what sort of uh, brought brought forth your, your interest in Pseudo-Dionysus, in particular the semantic uh, sort of categories and, and, and logical uh, 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 tools that Aquinas uses when, when he uh, reads Pseudo-Dionysus. Sure, well, I'll give a little background about myself. When I went to graduate school to study philosophy, I was interested in the philosophical thought of St. Thomas Aquinas. And, uh, you know, the standard story about Aquinas is that he's an Aristotelian, and, and for sure, he is influenced by Aristotle. He calls Aristotle the philosopher, because the in Aquinas's view, he's the exemplar of how philosophy ought to be done methodologically, and he adopts much of the substantive uh, ideas of Aristotle. Um, but, you know, I studied at the Catholic University of America, and there was, at the time, a great Neoplatonic uh, scholar teaching here, um, Eric Pearl, and so, you know, I took these classes on Neoplatonic thought with him, and I was noticing these Neoplatonic themes in Aquinas. And of course, I'm not, it's not original to me to notice that there are some great thinkers. It, it really began to be highlighted, these Neoplatonic themes uh, in the mid 20th century, shortly after, during, after World War II. Um, and so there's a recognition that Aquinas is no mere simple Aristotelian, He's the synthesis of many different strands of thought, including Aristotelian, Neoplatonic, Avicennian, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, what interested me in Aquinas's thought as I started to do my doctoral work is I noticed he's got this platonic, Neoplatonic theme of uh, ideas, capital I ideas, the platonic forms, which in the tradition after the time of Plato become uh, located in the mind of a divine being, ultimately in the mind of God. And so we see that, you know, uh, carried on in the Neoplatonic thinker uh, Plotinus, uh, who locates the uh, Platonic ideas, forms in the mind of uh, a being that's subordinate to the first cause, the one, um, that he calls nous or intellect, but ultimately Neoplatonists start to locate these ideas in the mind of God. And, and Dionysius or pseudo Dionysius is one of those thinkers who does that. And what interested me was in my research, the Aquinas is known as being an Aristotelian. Aristotelians say the, the forms of things when we're dealing with physical things are in the things, they're intrinsic. You know, the Aristotelian line is to reject the Platonic style separate forms. And then I saw Aquinas adopting this notion of ideas in the mind of God, advocating for these extrinsic forms. So I wanted to know how is it that they're both in his teaching, intrinsic and extrinsic forms, forms in the mind of God that form things in the world that have their own forms. What's the relation between them? And in the context of doing this research, I had to uh, grapple with and look into the influence of pseudo Dionysius on Aquinas's doctrine of divine ideas. So that's what led me down the path of starting to look at Dionysius in the uh, thought of Aquinas. Very interesting. Yeah, I know that in, in recent years, the Neoplatonic uh, aspects of Aquinas have, there, there's been a sort of revival in, in that department. I, I had uh, Dr. Gavin Kerr a while on to discuss participation because Aquinas has a very sort of 
novel theory of what participation is yeah. uh, and then he has a sort of causal participation theory that's very reminiscent of uh right. you know the neoplatonists yeah definitely very influenced by that and uh yeah it's, it's very interesting that you say that in addition to aristotle being a very uh very formative on Aquinas's thought that are there are a lot of these Neoplatonic texts circulating and and during uh, his his time at the university one such uh, you might say Neoplatonically influenced thinker was the, 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 the this author that we've been talking about pseudo Dionysus right so if if I may ask uh, who was pseudo Dionysus yeah. you know what is what does the pseudo mean and do, 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 do we know much about his life or or, or what, what can you tell us about that right well you're it's good that you're asking what does the pseudo mean and clearly it's indicating he's not really the Dionysius it's not as though his mother named him pseudo Dionysius uh well what scholars have figured out is that the author known as Dionysius who pseudo lived in the late fifth early sixth century AD um, and this author wrote his works as if they were composed by St. Dionysius the Areopagite. You know, St. Paul, it's recounted by Luke in Acts of the Apostles that St. Paul, when he went to Athens uh, to preach the gospel, um, converted somebody who was named Dionysius, who uh, was a member of the Athenian Judicial Council known as the Areopagus. So this is occurring historically in the first century. Uh, and so what's going on? Well, these works that are attributed uh, with this name Dionysius, um, there it, it's clear from the style, from the philosophical influences, the theological issues that the author is discussing that it's written actually much later. So we might think, Okay, so is this a successful forgery or is he trying to pull one over uh, on us, the author? No, uh, it, it, this is actually a rhetorical style of the time known as uh, declamatio, where you, know, you, you uh, take the name of an authority figure that's historical uh, as a rhetorical device to express the relevance of your ideas being in line with this thinker. So clearly we have a... Christian thinker here in Dionysius, pseudo Dionysius, who is uh, expressing sympathy with harmonizing Christianity with Greek philosophical thought of some sort. Um, now, the reason we know it's not the historical Dionysius in part is that it becomes recognized uh, certainly later on by the Renaissance that uh, we're seeing the influence of the fifth century Neoplatonic thinker Proclus on uh, this author. Uh, it's a number of Procline themes being repackaged from a Christian perspective. Uh, in fact, it's hypothesized that maybe the pseudo Dionysus is even a student of Proclus. Um, so this is a bit of background on him. He wrote a number of works uh, one of them is known as On the Divine Names, which is concerned with how do we have meaningful language about a God who's so transcendent that uh, our, not only can we not experience him in this lifetime, but our, our minds are so limited that we cannot know him, certainly in this lifetime. Uh, so how do we have meaningful language about God? Another work that this author wrote is On the Celestial Hierarchy, a work that examines the nine choirs of angels. He has another work on the ecclesiastical hierarchy that examines the various orders and liturgy of the church. And a fourth noteworthy work is on mystical theology, which is another work about how we can have language of God that looks at what's known as apathetic theology, uh, where we have negative naming of God, not negative in the sense of bad, but saying, given the limitations of you know, our ability to know God, at best we can say what God is not. Right, it's very interesting what you said about uh, sort of the rhetorical tactic of appropriating another person's name and sort of the subsequent uh, misattributed authorship that that results because uh, it, it this isn't an uncommon 
phenomenon that we see in the Middle Ages. And, and, and in contemporary, contemporaneous with Aquinas' time, there was another text that was circulating, um, the Liber de Causis. And it was right. assumed that like this text was like a uh, uh, part of, I think it was attributed to Aristotle originally, but yeah. I think it was Aquinas who was the one to put his finger on it. That no, okay, this doesn't sound like yes. uh, Aristotle. It's actually like the cliff notes of, I think Proclus was, was what, he, what he concluded. Yeah. yeah, so Proclus has this, you know, Neoplatonic work called uh, The Elements of Theology, where he tries to deduce in a geometric way, kind of like Euclid's elements from the more universal to the more particular, starting with the one, the first principle, and then reasoning down, uh, you know, the order and structure of reality and the causes. And uh, so this work that you mentioned, The Book of Causes, for a while, when it's first received in the Latin West, there's this thought that, you know, Aristotle, when we get to uh, book 12 of the metaphysics, and he starts to talk about the separate substances, the immaterial beings and God, in a way, he's, he, he doesn't espouse apophaticism, but he, he doesn't tell us much about these immaterial beings, other than that they are immaterial, they're pure actuality, God is thinking, thought thinking itself, a pure intellect that thinks the highest thing, which is himself. But he doesn't go into much greater detail. And so, you know, in the West, it's thought, oh, well, maybe this work on the book of causes, which studies the highest causes, these immaterial beings, uh, maybe this is the culmination of Aristotle's work, the metaphysics. And, you know, even early on, though, there's some suspicion that maybe that's not the case, you know. Uh, Aquinas' own teacher, Albert the Great, uh, thought that this is probably written instead by a Jewish author, Ibn Daoud. It's now thought that it, most scholars tend to think that uh, it's written by an Islamic author in the vicinity of Baghdad in the ninth century. Uh, suffice it to say, you're right, Aquinas, you know, later in life, you know, so he's born around 1224, he dies in 1274, late in his life, 1268, uh, the scholar of his time, William of Morbeck, he translates Proclus's Elements of Theology uh, from the Greek into Latin, and Aquinas gets a hold of this. And so he suddenly realizes in reading that, that, oh, whoa, this small book on the Book of Causes is, yeah, kind of like the crypt notes to Proclus' Elements of Theology, uh, recast from a, a creationist point of view, in the sense of, not in the sense of creationism versus Darwinian evolution, but in the sense of a first cause that is the cause of all of reality, including matter. And what's, what's particularly interesting in terms of our discussion here is that Aquinas writes a commentary on this book of causes, and in analyzing it, he has in front of him uh, 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 Pseudo-Dionysius. So he has in front of him as a way of interpreting it and correcting uh, what he sees as uh, a certain errors in the Book of Causes, Proclus's Elements of Theology, and Dionysius's Commentary on the Divine Names. It's very interesting that, that that we find all of these like Neoplatonic influences contemporaneous with with Thomas Aquinas and and, and that they're, it's not necessarily Plato that's the direct influence but it's more so these later Platonists like uh, Proclus that better being filtered down and trickled down into into all these uh, authors. Correct, but it's it although Aquinas notices of the Neoplatonists that he's encountering that there are some differences. It's worth pointing out that this term neoplatonism this is a, a terminology of modern scholars you know for aquinas these are all just the platonists they're following uh -huh. plato and then the platonic tradition so he does notice some differences maybe developments but he views them as a bundle as platonists the platonici he'll call them gotcha gotcha okay all right well i figured maybe we could shift the conversation a little bit to discussing uh how Aquinas uses this, the, 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 these writings of pseudo Dionysus into his broader metaphysical uh, uh, ideas. And, and but in, before we get to, to the metaphysics, I figured maybe we could lay the groundwork of Aquinas's more semantic principles and commitments. Uh, one, one of the interesting things that there's been growing attention is, is uh, 
how Aquinas understands um, the, the signification of uh, 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 of names and what, what, what they signify. Yeah. Um, and maybe maybe you you can tell us a little bit about it. Uh, I, yeah. Maybe Aquinas's broader metaf- uh, uh, semantic principles. Yeah. So we'll start with uh, this basic point that he's getting from Aristotle. Aristotle has his logical works, uh, and we need to understand that for Aristotelians, for Aristotle, logic. Uh, is the science, the art and science of right reasoning, but it's not just a formal mathematical kind of discipline, right? So it really concerns linguistic analysis to a degree as well. Uh, It's not the same as grammar, which looks at word structure as words, but it looks at how uh, words and judgments and reasoning map back onto reality and help us you know, discern the truth about aspects of reality. And so, you know, Aristotle has a little work called The Categories, where he looks at the fundamental kinds of words that we have. Some words pick out what he calls substances, uh, which are things in the world. He gives the example of the individual man, the individual horse. Uh, And then more generally, we can talk about human and horse in general and animal and body and plant, but most generally we can say of these things that are things in their own right, uh, that they're in his term substances. And then we've got these other nine categories of terms that are, they pick out attributes or features of substances, such as the fact that at least the physical substances of our experience have dimensions and that they can be quantified so that, you know, we can say the horse is so tall or so heavy. Um, And they have qualities like being such a color or such a temperature and relations and so forth and so on. So there's nine of these categories of terms which pick out the uh, term of art here is accidents, not in the sense of a mishap, but in the sense of non-essential features that a substance could have. And so we've got these 10 categories of terms But really, you know, the later, the Neoplatonists, when they're reading Aristotle's work, the categories, they point out, you know, he's not just talking about words here, he's talking about words of things. So they'll call sometimes some of them the work, the categories, the little metaphysics, because it's kind of uh, a classification of things as well as of terms. But suffice it to say, you know, Aristotle has this work the categories that look at our words about things. And then building off of that, he has a work that's sometimes translated with the Latinate term, De Interpretatione, on interpretation. The Greek was peri hermeneus, which looks at our judgments, where we put words together and make statements, assertions, you know. So uh, my dog Frega is brown. So it's not just the notion dog, it's not just the notion brown, but the dog is brown. And in this work, Aristotle points out that when we have look at our terms of which you know, we're using to make assertions, our words, um, well, all of this presupposes a relationship back to things in the world. And so to lay the foundation here now, This is known as the semantic triangle. Aristotle thinks that our words are signs or symbols of our concepts, and our concepts are the likenesses of things. So you go out in the world and there are things that share features in common, like my dog Frega and Fido the dog and Rover the dog. Uh, And that's the Aristotelian notion of these individuals being formed in the same way. And our mind gets at that form. And so he thinks that our concepts are formed naturally by our encounters with things in the world. So he says, our concepts are the likenesses of things. And our words are signs or symbols of those likenesses. And so through the mediation of our concepts, our words are pointing back to things in the world. Now, our words are conventional. So in English, I use the word dog, but someone who's French will say chien, and someone German hunt, and Aquinas will say canis. But those four conventional terms are all signs or symbols of the same concept, which is of the same likeness of this nature to be a dog. Uh, 
And so uh, sometimes people will read this as saying, you know, okay, so our words are indirectly signifying things in the world. I think it's better to say they directly signify things in the world in a mediated way through our concept. I think of like a window, you know, the window presents the world to us. And when I look out the window, if I were to point to it and say, hey, look at that, and I'm pointing at a dog, most people aren't going to say, what, the window? They're going to see through the window to the dog. And so too, our words are meant to get directly at things in the world. And yet through this window in the mind of the concept. And so if you view a triangle, you know, we could uh, view uh, one vertex on the right hand side is you know, having objects in the world. And at the top, the apex, the peak, we could have our concepts, uh, the word concept, and then down on the left hand, vertice, the vertex that could say words. And so we can visualize, you know, kind of our words pointing to our concepts, pointing to things in the world. And what's important to realize is that there's a, in Aquinas's estimation and the estimation of logicians of his time that he's following, which is known as a terminist logic, that there, it, it, when, we're, when he's looking at this connection between words and things in the world, um, he's not simply concerned with the meaning of the word, but what the word signifies. And this notion of signification is more than meaning. Uh, there's a, some scholars have described it as a psychological causal relationship. So things in the world are causing the concepts in my mind. And then subsequently we come up with words to kind of reverse engineer it and get back to things in the world. I, I've often heard that, that, that signification for the for medievals was, was sort of had more to do with like the relations. So, so certain particulars in the world, they relate to our, right, the concept in, 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 in my mind and through which that it relates to the terms that, that, that I express in, in a proposition. And it has more to do with relation. And whereas meaning, as I understand, that has more to do with like definitions. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. How are, what's the meaning of this word? But the point is, yeah, and we could we could make up words and say, what do you mean by that? What do I mean by that? Uh, and we, we do have to be careful about what people mean because we can talk past each other. But once we're on the same page with that, you know, uh, paradigmatically, we start by talking about things in the world, not just about our own concepts that we make up, but we start by talking about things in the world and our words kind of trace back to that. Right, right. Now, as I understand it, one of the concerns that Aquinas and other terminist semantic logicians had during this time was wh whether or not the, the, the terms that we use primarily refer to concepts or instantiations of, of, of those things. So when I say that, like, um, uh, there is a human listening to this conversation, the term human, you, what, what, is that, what does that refer to? What, what, what does that signify? That, that was sort of a concern that, that Aquinas had, correct? Right. So I, I think for him, principally, it's, it's signifying some reality, right? Uh, you know, you will get some philosophers later, you know, in the modern period, uh, like a Hume or a Locke, where, you know, what, what we're knowing are our own ideas, and those ideas are likenesses of things, maybe. Uh, but for Aquinas, if, if that were the case, then we're kind of cut off from the world. Um, and that's where, as I was getting at before, I think he views our concepts uh, more as windows. They're sort of self-effacing. They're presenting the world and not representing it. It's not merely a representation of what's out there. So with that said, building off of that, yes, our, our words are signs or symbols of our concepts. But when I say to you, hey, there's a dog out there, I'm not really conveying to you when I say, well, the word dog is I I immediately signifying my concept, but I'm not trying to convey to you, hey, I'm thinking about dog. I'm trying to convey to you something about reality. If I say, watch out for that dog, you know, you're not going to turn to me and say, oh, are you talking about your thought about dog? No, I I'm intending to convey to you something about reality. Uh, in Aquinas's estimation, I am, and you're going to take it that way too.
Right. That, that is something to keep in mind that the Aquinas is what we would call today a direct realist, that he just doesn't think that we're referring to like this, like um, mediating principle of like uh, uh, some some idea in the rationalist sense or the or some perception. We're referring to the thing through our our concepts. Right. And then, as I understand it, there's another um, sort of semantic tool in his toolbox that, that, that Aquinas employs, which is the distinction between the things signified and, and the mode of signification, uh, the res significata, the modus significande. And admittedly, uh, I've been having a really hard time understanding this yeah. distinction. Like I've been reading like Whipple, I've been reading Ashworth, and it's just not yeah. sinking in what, what yeah. Aquinas is getting at. Yeah, well, yeah, in, and in a way, and we have to note that sometimes with these terms, we might wonder like, why is Aquinas using this term? Why did he come up with a confusing term like thing signified? Because we're, we're going to, you know, my default thought when I first started to read that language was he was talking about items in the world immediately, like uh, my dog Frega or Fido the dog or the tree that I'm looking at outside my window. We talk about those as things. And, you know, normally when Aquinas uses the Latin term res for thing, that's he's talking about beings. But he's inherited this term of art, res significata, thing signified, and it doesn't mean those individual items. What he's getting at when he says that words, if we're giving a semantic analysis of our words, uh, there's, there's some aspect that's being signified by the word. And in other contexts, he'll sometimes say forma significata, the form signified. And so paradigmatically, when we talk about items in the world, uh, we're talking about kinds of things. Fido is a dog. Well, what do we mean by dog? A barking animal, right? Um, well, the word is signifying that nature, that kind, that formality. And so that's what's meant by thing signified, namely some kind of form, some type of thing. Where we get this added complexity Aquinas brings out following the terminist logicians of his time is that these words don't only signify a, a, a type, um, a formality, like dogness, um, but they signify according to a certain mode, uh, modus significandi, a mode of signifying. We could translate that as a way of signifying. And the two fundamental modes that are identified here are concrete and abstract. So continue with my example of dogs, you know, uh, dog is what we'd call a concrete word because you could use that word to talk about an item in the world, an object, what we would normally call a thing. And so we can say of my dog, Frega, he is a dog. I've used the word concretely there, but now we can speak in the abstract. He's a dog because he has dogness. So now we're using the word a word in an abstract way, according to an abstract mode. And Aquinas would say whether we're using, in these two examples, dog or dogness, concretely or abstractly, the same res significata, thing signified, the same formality is at stake here. So in both cases, we're talking about the same formality, but one is according to a concrete mode, and we're talking about a dog, and the other we talk about dogness abstractly. In both cases, we're talking about dogness, but when we talk about a dog, we're, we're adding the notion of haver of dogness. When we talk about dogness, we're just talking about the formality. Or if we go with an accidental term, incidental feature that my dog Frege has, is that he's brown. So we can point to him and say, he is brown, and for the in Latin, you know, the adjective brown can stand for a thing, a brown thing. Um, so he is a haver of brownness. So we can talk about the brown thing, the haver of brownness, and the formality of brownness, and the same thing signified, using that term of art, form signified is at stake in both cases. And, you know, the, it, 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 in... Uh, some later scholars or, uh, you know, uh, scholastic philosophers will give the example of all these different modes when we talk about health, 
we can talk about our, or no, what was it? Um, oh, pain, you know, pain, painful, painfully, and even the interjection, ouch! <laughs> the same formality is signified in each way, but according to different uh, grammatical forms in this case. Okay, that, that's very interesting. Um, and and, and if, if if I may ask, does any, do, do these terminus semantics have anything to do with Aquinas's commitments to linguistic ambiguity or analogy? I, I ask this question just because I know that uh, Ralph McNerney wrote this monograph on uh, analogy, and he tries to connect the two ideas that uh, ad unum analogy, what, what we would call our healthiness model of analogy, it's very similar to uh, Aquinas' commitments to what this distinction between the thing signified and motive signification. But as I understand it, scholars have kind of been a little bit uncomfortable with conflating yeah. those two. Yeah. So McInerney, he has, certainly he's got a lot to offer in his works on analogy, but the, dis, the, the role of the distinction between thing signified and mode of signification, he, as I recall, attributes that sees that at work in Aquinas' doctrine of analogy for all kinds of analogy, whether we're talking, uh, uh, if you will, horizontally about things in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so things like dogs and trees and stones even that are substances, are beings. And as we said, those incidental traits, like their quantities, their qualities, their relations, those exist too, but in a secondary way with right. reference back to the primary sense of being, which is substance. McInerney sees that distinction there just as much as he does between things signified and mode of signification, just as much as he does with what scholars will call transcendental analogy, right. or if you will, vertical analogy, where we're using words to talk about both God and his effects, namely creatures. And I think what you're bringing out is what scholars like Ashworth have brought out is uh, that, that distinction between uh, things signified and mode of signification is really only relevant when we're dealing with transcendental mm. analogy. Right, right. I mean, it's important to remember that for Aquinas, even though that he has this the, the, this idea of uh, analogy predicated of, of how God subsists and we subsist, it also attains for, for for as you said the, uh, the, the 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 ten categories. Like a sub, the way that a substance exists is different than a, an accident like yeah. whiteness or things like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if I may then ask, how do uh, Aquinas' terminus semantics connect with his um, his commitments, his theological commitments to the fact that we can meaningfully talk about God? Right, right, exactly. Because, you know, it's, it's worth noting here that you get uh, some uh, philosophers, theologians who would say, you know, uh, because God is so transcendent and ineffable that really we can only say what God is not, that God is and what he is not, um, and uh, not what he is. And so we can't have any uh, affirmative naming of God that gets beyond the relation of creature to God as he is in himself. And so uh, Aquinas himself, you know, notably does say that in this lifetime, we can only say that God is and what he is not. And so if you just ran by that statement alone, you're going to think that he's following in that thoroughgoing apophatic tradition. Um, but we find in the first part of the Summa Theologiae, where he looks at divine naming, that in fact, even though he says what I just noted, uh, he draws a distinction here and he takes the task as an example case, the Jewish philosopher Moses Maimonides. So Moses Maimonides also says, you know, the best we can do is say that God is and what he is not. And so either our names for God are that are affirmative, uh, are causal names. Um, so, you know, famously, you know, we've got the Aristotelian argument for a prime mover. Well, prime mover, we can call God prime mover, but that's not naming him as he is in himself. That's really naming the relation he has to creatures as their mover or as their creator, but really even more to the point, it's naming the dependence of creatures on him. You know, it, it, it'd be as if, you know, the example I like to give to my students when we reason from effect to cause and name the cause that way is there's a knocking at the door and I infer there is something that is the door knocker out there. I don't know if it's a human, I don't know what it is, but I can call it the door knocker, but 
you know, the door knocker in itself has a nature, but I don't know what it is. I'm naming it from its effects. And it's it's important to remember, uh, we're going to get to this a little later, but Aquinas actually thinks that there are some names that are more appropriate as causal names versus names that describe Correct. God as he sort of subsists in himself. And yes, as I was just giving like prime mover or first efficient cause at the famous, at the end of the so-called famous uh, second way argument. So the first way argument, prime mover, second way argument for the existence of God, first efficient cause. Um, okay, so... And then, you know, following on this, what I was saying with Moses Maimonides, and then we've got negative names, like God is immaterial, uh, God is incorporeal. And, and then we're posed with a challenge. What about when we're told that God is good? And scripture says that God is good. And we believe that God is good. And, you know, by Aquinas's readings, we're getting Maimonides saying, well, those affirmative names, uh, they're really either disguised causal names. So when we say God is good, we really mean that God is the cause of good things because we don't know God's goodness. Or we really, it's a disguised negative name. We really mean he's not bad. And Aquinas wants to say, no, we mean much more than that. We don't simply mean when we say God is good, that he's not bad. And we don't simply mean that he's the cause of good things. In fact, He's the cause of good things because in his very nature, he's goodness itself. Ah, but now comes the question, how do we know that if we don't know God's very nature? And what gives us justification for calling him good if we don't know God's goodness? But I'll pause to see uh, if you want to add something. Well, you yeah, know, I mean, that, that that makes a whole lot of sense. And, and then if I can maybe try to connect this with Aquinas's terminus semantical uh, commitments, the, the, the things signify when we say God is good is God is that God actually that, that goodness actually subsists in the Godhead. But the, the way it's signified, it, it, it kind of puts a limitation on, on how we talk about God, because the only way that we've we've experience goodness or being or, or any of these transcendental categories is in created being. Correct. So Aquinas, you know, it's, if we should start by knowing that Aquinas says that any name that we give to God, it's somehow in some way taken from his effects. Uh, so we start because he's unknown. We start with his effects. We reason back to the fact that there's got to be a first cause. And then we can name these causal names that are pure causal names they're affirmative names, but we can call them relative because we're relative affirmative names because uh, it, it talks about how God is related to the creature as his effect, or as I say more precisely, how the creature, the effect, is related to the cause and dependent upon something we know not what, but that it is. And so we call it by this name in terms of its causality. Then the next step, and he's he's following this methodology that he's seeing in Dionysius, namely a threefold path for naming God. And so we take the first step of affirming that there is such a first cause. And then the via negativa, we take the next path and say, okay, but if it's first cause, it's so transcendent, it's uncaused. Uh, and so then we say what it is not. And so we can start to ascribe all these negative names. Again, not negative in the sense of bad, but saying what this first cause is not, how it's unlike its effects, right? So if it's first, it's uncaused. If it's uncaused, well, there can't be any composition in it of parts or principles, because if that were the case, well, there's got to be a composer to put the composition together or hold it together. <laughs> Excuse me. So he goes on, well, if it's uncomposed, which is to say it's simple, there's no composition of form and matter. This being is immaterial. It's incorporeal. If it's incorporeal and immaterial, it's immutable. It can't undergo changes the way material things do. And if it's immaterial and unchanging, then it's not in time. And so it's eternal in the sense of atemporal. Um, and there are other such negative names that we can follow. What's interesting, and here's where Aquinas um, really kind of goes beyond, you know, takes Dionysius and runs with him, maybe even farther than Dionysius intended, where he starts following this negative path, this via negativa. And if you will, at the summit of it, 
is the fact that God is infinite, not finite, and we infer that he's perfect. And we might say, okay, well, if, if he's perfect, that, isn't that an affirmative name? But we can reach this via the via negativa by saying he's not lacking in any respect. If God is a being in which there's no composition, he's uncaused, and there's no even composition of what Aquinas would describe as essence and existence, but his nature is pure beingness, and in an unlimited, infinite way, then he pre-contains in himself every perfection. So he's not just perfect in one respect, like a perfect baseball game or a perfect score on a test, but in every respect, uh, he's not lacking in any respect. And Aquinas thinks that this conclusion allows us to, he does sort of a jujitsu move here, to now say, ah, well, if he's perfect, any perfection that can be said of his effects can be said of God as well. Now, there's a distinction to be made here, and we can talk about that in a moment. Right, right. Now, as I understand it, this is very much a Dionysian theme that even when we're making negations, at a certain point in our mystical theology, we have to end up negating our negations because we do have to affirm yeah, in a sort of yeah. super eminent uh, but like God is, you know, supra essential or supra good, or like he, he, he has goodness, but he has it, but the way that goodness subsists in God is in a higher mode than it does in creaturely perfections. That's right. And we don't know that mode, right? So we're acknowledging, you know, Aquinas says uh, the, the, the only way we can prove the existence of God is uh, by what he calls a quia demonstration. We reason from effect to cause and a quia demonstration, uh, you know, the other kind, reasoning from cause to effect, known as a propter quid demonstration, a reason from cause to effect, and the cause tells you why something is the way it is. So I like to give the example in class of the fact that whales nurse their young, and you know, some students haven't thought about that before, and then, but people frequently quickly realize, oh, because they are mammals, and so one can reason, all mammals nurse their young, all male, all whales are mammals, therefore all whales nurse their young. It's because a whale is a mammal that it's the sort of thing that nurses its young. But to know that, you need to know the nature of mammals and the nature of whales. We don't know the nature of this being whose existence we're trying to prove. So how do we prove the existence of God? Starting with an effect and reasoning back to the fact of the matter, there must be a first cause. So everything else that's deduced about this being really is establishing only the fact of the matter, not the how or the why. Uh, so, you know, even once he starts to deduce, oh, this being must be pure goodness, but I don't know God's pure goodness. So we're deducing that it must be the case, but I don't know that whatness. Right, right. It's almost as if the the, the triplex via also all, all these different ways of naming God sort of all come together. Like they, they, they they're all intertwined. You might say where we have all of our names are deduced causally, and from those uh, the, 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 those causal deductions, we can yes. affirm that there is goodness in God, but we have to negate uh, the goodness of creaturely participated perfection. Right, right. And so we can start with the perfection uh, like goodness and say. You know, here's some good things. Uh, my mom, the flag, apple pie, and we and God is the cause of all that, so He must be good. Ah, but not yet another good thing. So He's not good in, according to the mode, the way they are. So how is He good? Well, in a higher way. Now, one might then run with this, and there's a passage in uh, Scotus Eugena where he talks about God. You know, we could say God is a worm, God is not a worm, God is the hyperworm, the superworm. No, Aquinas would not go that route. We want to be careful when we say that all perfections are pre-contained in God, and so he can be named from these perfections, from the perfections of his effects. Some of these names can only be said of God metaphorically. So God could be called a stone because he's steadfast, or, you know, like a lion uh, in terms of like courage or something like that, but um, not literally. Why? Well, 
as we use these names of created things, created natures, uh, they are they imply limitation because to be a stone is to be a material thing. So built into that name stone and that nature stone is the limitation of being matter and hence composed. And we've deduced that this being is uncomposed. He's simple. Uh, being a lion is to be a material thing. Being a cheetah. So cheetahs are swift, and that is indeed a perfection of a cheetah, but God could only be said to be swift in a metaphorical way. So which names, by Aquinas' estimation, can be said of God literally? Well, what we call transcendental names, which are attributes that a being possesses in as much as it's a being. So, you know, in other contexts, Aquinas will show that whatever is, is good, is true, is one, because these are attributes of being that are not layered on top, like getting a tan or becoming warm, but they're aspects of a being in as much as it's a being. So to be a being is to have these attributes. If God is beingness itself, he is that attribute. And the other, so the, so names of transcendental perfections, those can be literally predicated of God by Aquinas' estimation, and also names of what we could call pure perfections, names of perfections that are not transcendental, they're not found in every being, um, such as well, wisdom or power, um, but they are, or, or will, for example, or intellect, uh, but uh, they are names of perfections that don't indicate the limitation of matter. So wisdom in Socrates, well, Socrates is a material thing, but wisdom as such does not imply the limitation of matter. Intellect does not imply the limitation of matter. Power does not imply the limitation of matter. So these are described as pure perfections. And the, the basic, we want to acknowledge here also, the basic line of reasoning is Aquinas follows this triplex via, this threefold way of naming God, moving beyond the way of negation, Aquinas says, okay, we've established that God is uh, infinitely perfect, pure existingness, so he doesn't lack any perfection of being. W what allows us to attribute these perfections to God? Well, here Aquinas applies um, an axiom, a metaphysical law, a rule that he trots out time and again in his analyses, namely, every agent makes something like itself. Now, it doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one correlation. Sure, you know, fire makes fire and dogs beget dogs, but humans beget chairs, <laughs> make chairs, uh, and I'm not a chair or the artisan is not a chair, but the chair is in the mind of the artisan. And even, you know, when you get the sun uh, radiating on the earth it's and making me warm, it's not making another sun, but it's making me warm like the sun. Um, it's giving something that it has. At the very least, Aquinas says the agent, the efficient cause, the maker, the doer, is actualizing the effect. And so the cause, the maker, the producer, has actuality, and it's actualizing the effect. So at the very least, that's happening. And so his position is that, well, given that every agent makes something like itself, if we find these transcendental and pure perfections in God's effects, they must be in God, and not just metaphorically, but literally as well. Right, right. Okay, yeah, that, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. So then circling back to Aquinas's uh, uh, semantic commitments then, yeah. how, how exactly does this fit with, with this distinction between the things signified and the mode Thank of you. signification? Yeah. That's important to bring up, because so here again, you know, he's reading Dionysius, and he's bringing with him the toolkit from Aristotle, from the terminus logic of his time. And he's saying, look at our words, words like good or goodness. You know, there's something that is signified, uh, the thing signified, the formality. So both the word good and goodness signify the formality of that which is desirable, desirability. Okay, so when we use the word good, saying you are good, we're saying you're a haver of goodness. But when we talk about goodness, we're just talking about the pure formality of goodness. So the former, you are good, goodness is predicated of you according to a concrete mode. When I talk about 
the formality of goodness that all good things have in common, now we're using an abstract mode of signification. So the question is, okay, what about when we predicate these names of God? And here we, he's both uh, employing these Aristotelian terminist semantic distinctions, as well as the Dionysian approach is saying, well, you know, when we apply these names of God, there's got to be both an affirmation and negation. Uh, so there's strength and limitation both to concrete terms and to abstract terms. When I call God good, okay, that has the advantage of bringing out that there's a subsistent being there, a thing, as it were, God. However, this concrete use of goodness to talk about a good thing implies a haver of goodness and implies composition. Well, we need to negate that. So here we bring back the way of negation. So, oh, well, we want to deny this concrete mode of signification. And so then we say, oh, so he's just goodness itself. Well, that's great. We have gotten rid of that notion of composition that we have with concrete terms. But the problem with that is just to say is goodness itself. Well, we don't encounter in our experience, pure subsisting formalities. Uh, formalities in our experience always enter into composition with something. And so when we use abstract terms like goodness, whiteness, freeness, dogness, it doesn't describe a thing. It doesn't describe a complete being. So there's a limitation to that language as well. So there's strengths and weaknesses, both to using concrete and abstract terms when we talk about God, and we need to be aware of the limitations of both. And we can do a kind of course correction and to say, okay, well, then God is a subsistent goodness. Okay, that highlights, you know, and tries to rectify that problem. But of course, I don't know what subsistent goodness is. Yeah, if I remember correctly, uh, just to make a comparison, it's almost like we're, 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 when we're engaging in our the, the, this theology of naming God, we're sort of highlighting sort of the limitations that we have when we're uh, when, when we're able to to affirm positively uh, positive attributes of, of of God. I mean, I remember Jacques Maritain. I think it's in Degrees of Knowledge where he compares the writings of Pseudo Dionysus to almost like uh, like a Kantian critique. Like the, the, these are the limitations that we have. In, in when we predicate names of God is that we only experience things like good, goodness or wisdom or justice or being in participated creaturely instantiated modes. And so yeah. even though that, that it obtains in God, we have to acknowledge that those names are gonna fall short to how it actually subsists in, in God. Correct, that's right. Every name is gonna fall short. Yep, because God transcends naming and intelligibility. Right, right. And okay. yet Aquinas does wanna say, these names are not merely metaphorically said of God, and they're not merely negation, even though according to the limitation of our mind, we have to apply this negation. You know, I was thinking of an, a comparative analogy to bring out is, and this I'm sure this limps in many respects, um, and certainly this is not directly in Aquinas, but you know, modern physicists tell us that light behaves both as a wave and as a particle, right? So right. we can observe uh, wave-like behavior, and we can observe particle-like behavior, but when it's behaving like a particle, it's not behaving like a wave. Mm. But, and I'm thinking both as a parallel with concrete and abstract signification. Imagine if someone say to you, now there is a light that behaves neither as a wave nor as a particle, and yet in a way as both, and we'd have to grant that. We could say, okay, I'm willing maybe to acknowledge the fact of the matter, but I never can witness light behaving like that. Right, right. This side of the eschaton. Uh, point yeah, that's right, right. Exactly. Yeah, not in this lifetime. It's all well and good. My point being that it's all well and good to say, okay, uh, God has, because someone might come away with think, uh, thinking like, well, Aquinas is trying or is uh, trying to get too much purchase on God by saying, okay, we take the, res significata, the form signified by saying goodness, and we negate both uh, the abstract mode and the concrete mode, and now you've got the formality. Uh, and somehow we now know God. And I, I think what Aquinas is saying, no, no, no. Whenever we know or talk about the formality of goodness, we're either thinking about it 
concretely where we're thinking about a composite thing, or we're thinking about it abstractly where we're thinking about just a formality and not a thing. So we bring in these negations, but we haven't gotten to an understanding of God. We're again, there's a negation built in there, but also I would say that quia method, we're just stating the fact of the matter. Mm -hmm. God is goodness itself. But what that is, I do not know. Right. Just like the example you gave of someone knocking at your door. It's like, I don't know who, who that person could be. I don't know, you know, yeah. even if it is, if it is a person. If it's a person. Exactly. But, but, but I know that something is causing the knocking, right? Correct. I figured maybe we could shift the conversation a little bit to discussing how both pseudo Dionysus and Aquinas view God's uh, God's goodness, because a good, a, a, a central theme in pseudo Dionysus's mysticism is that goodness mysteriously sort of precedes being like it's it's prior to to being right. and non-being right. uh, and for that reason it's a more appropriate name to predicate of god even than to be to be uh yeah. and aquinas grants this to a certain degree that this is the case but but it's, it's kind of it's rather subtle how, how does aquinas read pseudo dionysus in in, in in this manner on on god and goodness yeah, so I mean, we should know that pseudo Dionysius is certainly following in this Platonic, Neoplatonic tradition of saying, you know, the 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 highest principle, you know, the best name is good. Plato talks about that in the Republic, um, in his work, the Sophist. He talks about, you know, the form of being, but that's subordinate even to the good because, you know, even the form of being. Uh, participates. It participates in otherness. So there's, at the level of being, there's always alterity, there's always otherness, there's always opposition. The first principle transcends all that. It's pure unity. You know, Plotinus calls it the one. Certainly uh, Dionysius would agree with that. Um, and so there's this tradition of seeing the notion of being as subordinate to the notion of good. Um, and the way Aquinas reads Dionysius on this in terms of his presentation is that Dionysius is saying goodness extends to more uh, in terms of its causality. So I should note that, uh, you know, scholars discuss this, whether the triplex via, the threefold way of naming God that Aquinas is finding in Dionysius with this third way, the way of eminence that I was describing in Aquinas, is that really in Dionysius, where he's treating these as affirmative names, like good, wise, etc., affirmative names that are, if you will, absolute, non-relative. Aquinas is treating them as non-relative, non-causal. Uh, Dionysius makes clear in his divine names work that, no, all of these names are causal names, even these eminential names. And you know what? In his very commentary on the work, uh, the commentary on the divine names, Aquinas acknowledges that Dionysius is treating these names here, even these affirmative ones that are eminential, as causal names. So he's got Dionysius is calling God good from his effects that are good. He's calling him being from his effects that are beings. He's calling him wise from his effects that are wise. And the first among these is good because the causality of goodness extends to more. Why does it extend to more? Well, because Aquinas is saying, if we view God as kind of the exemplar of all things, everything that he's making, he's making in his likeness, right? So uh, if we follow that language of being, Aquinas reads that as saying, for Dionysius in his interpretation, that uh, that name of being is bringing out the perfection, not just of being, but of actual being. So what's in potentiality, and for Aquinas's view as an Aristotelian, that's going to be prime matter, the ultimate underlying stuff in the physical universe that underlies all forms, that's pure potentiality. In itself, it doesn't actually exist. So it's not... Uh, exemplified by the form of beingness, if you will, that God is, but in as much as God is good. So God's goodness extends not just to actual being, but potential being as well. And so viewed from this Aristotelian interpretation, 
Aquinas is saying, this is why Dionysius is saying the name of good is the preeminent name as a causal name. And that being or essay existing is, if you will, a secondary name. It's the first of the perfections that God make, gives to things when he makes things because he makes them actually be. It's the first of God's gifts. Uh, but among those gifts, there's the causality, there, there is the underlying pure potential material substratum in physical things. It never exists on its own. In itself, it's pure potentiality. God has made that too. And that's in accord with his goodness. So if we conceive then of, as you say, the, 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 this pure potentiality as kind of a non-being, uh, uh, in a sense, and I, I think that the, 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 there are some passages where Aquinas is going to read uh, Dionysus in, in this light, then, then we can say that if God is sort of the, the co God's cause of providence extends to everything, then God moving everything and shaping everything and moving things from potency to act, that causal goodness is going to be prior to the actuality and potentiality. Correct. And so in his own work, uh, the Summa Theologiae, there, an objector says, when a, a, because Aquinas there tells us, ah, but the most proper name for God is he who is. And he gives an argument as to why that is. And an objector says, well, wait a second. Dionysius tells us that really the, what should be the most proper name is good, goodness itself. And Aquinas says, yes, that is the principal name as a causal name. Mm. And I think by that, he, he doesn't just mean following that first way of causality. He's, he, 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 but we'll get beyond that. But, but yes, in terms of the order of causality, but this isn't merely a causal name. It turns out to be an absolute name. But if we're following that first way of causality and that alone, then yeah, the name of good viewed from this formal causal perspective is chief among the names of God, even compared to being, existing, essay. Ah, but if right. we follow that triplex via through to the way of eminence and the end of that, then we see that, ah, but considered in himself and in itself, goodness presupposes being. Mm. Because what's desirable is what is complete, what's actual and more fundamental than is to be. And God is by his very nature. So he's pure beingness. He is a subsisting existence, mm. uh, an infinite ocean of existence, if you will. Damascene says, you know, the infinite ocean of substance, uh, pure beingness. And so the name he who is, is most appropriate because uh, considered on its own, Aquinas gives us three reasons and it ties to the semantic theory. Um, it's the most universal. All other names either imply limitation, like when we say wise, well, not everything that is, is wise. To be is more universal, or these transcendental names like good, true, one, presuppose and piggyback off of the name of being, because those are ways of talking about being from a different perspective. So it's the most universal name, he says, uh, or the most universal perfection, being that is. Um, the second explanation he gives is that uh, according to the mode uh, of signification, it doesn't imply limitation. Uh, so we've got that. And then uh, since we've built in the verb there is, every verb brings with it a tense, you know, the past, present, or future, and is Con signifies, along with indicating actuality, that God actually exists, it indicates present actuality, and that most of all applies to God, who's outside mm -hmm. the timeline entirely. And so it's the most, not just the most, yeah, it's the most fitting name for God. Um, but it's still not a proper name like Hunter or Greg Doolin, uh, meaning the name of an individual. We don't know that. The closest maybe, he tells us, is the tetragrammaton of the Hebrews, and mm. not the word tetragrammaton, but those four letters, which are unsayable and indicates God's ineffability. So he doesn't spend too much time saying, acknowledging the tetragrammaton other than say, maybe that would be the closest to a proper name, but this is the 
closest thing we have to a proper name, namely God is he who is. Mm. Right. And it almost seems then for, for Aquinas, we, we, we can, there seems to be like a distinction to be made between the, the most proper name for God as he subsists in himself versus names that a name that's most proper for God as he's causally providential. And goodness we can grant is the most proper name to grant to God insofar as we're describing God's cause of providence. Correct. But the, most, but the most appropriate name to describe God sort of as he subsists in himself is simply a mysterious he, divinus. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, uh, Gregory, th- this has been a really, really insightful conversation. I, I think we're, we're getting close to the end of, of the interview, though. So uh, if I can ask maybe a, a couple closing questions, um, what would you say is the main difference, if at all, between Pseudodionysus and Aquinas, specifically with respect to, you know, what we've been talking about there, their understanding of the naming of of, of God? As, as I understand it, um, Aquinas famously believe, uh, argues that God is the, the subsistent act of Tobinus itself, ipsum esse subsistence. Whereas for Dionysus, you know, as we said, goodness is sort of a sort, sort of a causally prior name to God. It's more appropriate to to, to God, and God, in some sense, is uh, is beyond being. I think is the terminology that that, that Dionysus uses. Yeah, I would agree with that entirely. Um, it is worth noting, you know, there are texts like, in his commentary on that book of causes that we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast that Aquinas actually takes on the language of uh, the Platonist, Neoplatonist, and says, God is supra ends. He's beyond being. Uh, now, with that said, he then clarifies because our notion of being, when we use it in the concrete to talk about a haver of existence. Right. Well, God is not that. Right. So in that sense, God is beyond that because the sort of being that is a haver of existence, its existence is other than its essence. And that's the case not just for physical beings like you and me, a dog, a tree, a stone, but even for angels, immaterial beings. Uh, they might be pure formal beings, but they are not identical with their very existence. That's the case for God alone. So we can call him being in the concrete sense, a being, uh, but we want to apply that way of negation and say, ah, but we want to deny that concrete mode, not in the same way that the effect is that creatures have where they're havers of existence. Mm. And we say, ah, but he is beingness itself, ah, but not as an incomplete formality, but as, as you put it, subsisting existence itself right it's almost as if aquinas is going to read uh th- th- this idea of god being beyond being as, as as indicating that god's not participating being like god's not being as as yeah. we experience it that's right yeah hey, so he's he's agreeing and disagreeing with dionysius but he's definitely going beyond or you know differing in the sense that he's emphasizing uh essay is the preeminent name he who is and uh he does seem, he does more than seem, he thinks that following this way of eminence, we really can meaningfully and properly, which is to say non-metaphorically, literally, assert these absolute affirmative names of God. And that they're getting, he says they're, they're substantial names. They're getting at his essence, even though we don't know his essence. It's, you know, they could, we could draw a parallel. It's kind of like, if there really is what physicists, um, physicists talk about, dark matter, um, well, we've got a word that's signifying that stuff. We don't know that stuff, but our word is meant to signify that stuff. And mm-hmm. so, too, our word good when said of God, true when said of God, being with when said of God is getting at his essence, but it's not claiming to know his essence. If I can maybe ask uh, a closing question. Um yeah. Do you have any maybe reading recommendations for those who'd want to study more about Aquinas and Pseudo-Dionysus or even the, 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 the what yeah, we were talking so, about in the beginning? Yeah. You know, I, I would recommend my you know professor whom I had as a grad student, Eric Pearl. He has a book called Theophany, the Neoplatonic Philosophy of Dionysius the Areopagite. And then on the side of Aquinas, the book that you highlighted by Fran O'Rourke on uh, the metaphysics that's in Aquinas's commentary on Dionysius's divine names.
And then in terms of, uh, for those of you who, who cannot uh, read Greek, myself included, <laughs> I, I, I've been relying on the classics of Western spirituality's uh, translation of Pseudo-Dionysus theory, oh, yes. Apogeit, and it's very good. The artwork is a little weird. I, I know I've talked, I know I've complained on the show yeah. about the artwork, but it's a very good uh, readable translation. Yes. Yeah. And there's, and we should note, there's a brand new translation out, uh, uh, an exposition of the divine names, the book of blessed Dionysius, St. Thomas Aquinas. It's a full text with complete English translation of Sarazin's Latin rendering of pseudo Dionysius's the divine names, followed by Aquinas's exposition in Latin and English. It's a concordance. Uh, so you've got the Latin on one side, the English on another. Uh, it's translated and edited with an introduction by Michael Agros, and it is put out by Thomas More College Press uh, out of New Hampshire. And so that just came out, and it's a great boon for students of Aquinas. You know, Aquinas is frequently cited as, well, oh, his Latin is so easy. Well, that's in the Summa Theologiae. In his commentary on the Divine Names, it's a very different style of Latin as well. Uh, it's worth trying to work through, but it's nice to have an English translation, particularly with the concordance, so you can look over on the left and see what the Latin is. Oh, I'd be very excited to, to get to that, because I know that when, when it comes to uh, the commentary on the Divine Names, there hasn't really been an Those. English translation before. Like, I know in the Penguin edition, there's like the preface, but it's like, he yeah. stopped, like, it's just the preface. Like, you just, he right. stops short and it's like, no, I want to know more. Yeah. Yep. Oh, all right. Well, Dr. Gregory Doolin, this has been really nice. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun.